Uh, this evening, we're actually um, looking ahead just at uh, one, I well, actually it's a few ideas in the Gospel of John, but I think it's sufficiently far away so that when we get back to it again, it won't seem like we're revisiting the same topic. But what I'd like to do is read a portion of John chapter 12. I'd like to read verses 20 through 26, uh, but we're going to be looking specifically at verses 25 and 26. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Uh, this is what we read. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, as you've already been reminded, we've been looking at uh, those virtues that the Spirit of God uh, produces in our lives uh, by his grace, which if we are willing to cultivate them, the Lord will bless us. Now, so far we've seen, and again, I'll just say this quickly by way of review because we don't want to forget really any of these virtues that the Lord uh, tells us are particularly praiseworthy. So far we've seen that the Lord favors humility. As a matter of fact, it's one of those things that um, is essential to putting on any of these virtues. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord. James writes in James 4.10, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And he will exalt you. One thing crossed my mind as, as Greg was um, expounding this evening what it is we're doing here. How we are in the presence of a God who is a consuming fire. Um, that is true. And we should worship him as such. But do we often think that we're also in his presence wherever we are and whatever we're doing. We live in the presence of this God. And realizing how holy he is should make us think very carefully of what it is we do and how we live. I mean, that really has to do with the, the fear of the Lord, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, that was one of the things we saw. But we also saw that the Lord favors mercy. He favors compassion. He loves it when we show compassion to others. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And he doesn't mean by that blessed are those who who refrain from striking somebody who's done something evil to them, although he does mean that. But it also means showing them you know, compassion, showing them grace, like the Good Samaritan who helped his enemy along the road. Uh, the Lord tells us that he favors those who seek to please him, which, as we've already heard this evening, was the reason why he was with Jesus. Now, Jesus is God in human flesh, but let's not forget that he was a man and continues to be a man, but lived with all the limitations that we have, excepting, of course, sin. But he lived in a way that was pleasing to his Father, and that's why he says the Father was with him. Jesus says in John 8, 29, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. This is another way of saying Jesus always served him which is what we're looking at this evening. And as I've just mentioned, and I didn't want to get out of the order of the slides, the Lord favors those who tremble at his word, those who fear him. Remember, the Lord says in Isaiah 66, verse 2, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my words. And again, 
We understand what that means is living in, again, the presence of a God who is holy. That's what it means to tremble at his word. Our God is a consuming fire. If it weren't for the Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy, we would be devoured by God's holiness. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are safe because we've been cleansed, because we've been clothed with his righteousness, and now the Father loves us. But that doesn't mean that he isn't holy and that we shouldn't be afraid of dishonoring him. Now we've also seen, and again as we've been reminded already this evening, that the Lord doesn't look at all of us in the same way. And he doesn't treat each of us equally. He favors certain individuals. He favors those who take his word seriously. He favors those who seek to become what he desires, who seek to do what he says. Now, we don't want to get confused here because we do understand that we are all saved by his grace in Jesus Christ alone, that justification which is being declared righteous by God because of the righteousness of Christ alone, that that alone gets us into heaven. And that justification is received purely by faith and is not earned by anything we do. What we do really doesn't make any difference in that regard, except, of course, what we do is the evidence that we have actually received this justification. But sanctification is something that all of us are more or less involved in. Some of us will work harder to become like Jesus Christ. And to the degree that we do, and we need to remember that God has given to all of us all the same tools with which to work. He's given us all the means of grace. He's given us all his spirit. Among that, you know, all of us who, who basically have the same set of tools, we're, some of us are going to work harder and some less hard. Some of us are going to succeed more and others less. But to the degree that we succeed, to that degree, the Lord says he will bless us above our brothers and sisters in the Lord. If that wasn't true, God would not single out in his word those that he is particularly inclined to bless and to listen to when they pray. So tonight, let's look at one more virtue the Lord says he favors. One more thing that we should be striving after in our lives, and it is that virtue of a servant's heart. Now again, our ultimate example is Jesus Christ, and that's the reason why he points to himself as the example that we are to follow. In Mark 10, verses 35 through 45, we, we read this, and again, this is a very familiar um, story in Scripture, account in Scripture, of two men who were seeking, um, seeking honor, seeking glory for themselves, and how they went about it the wrong way. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's quite a bold statement. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now again, James and John didn't get what they were after. They actually got something that they weren't after, which was to go through the sufferings that Jesus said they would have to go through. 
And actually, the Lord tells us that all of us, through tribulation, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus was, was basically telling us that what it is that they were seeking wasn't wrong. It was just simply the way in which they were seeking it. Uh, Jesus pointed out that he wasn't like James or John who wanted to become great at the expense of others. I want you to, to see something that, that I don't think we often see, and that is Jesus didn't rebuke them for seeking greatness. It was only the way in which they were seeking it, and that was that we may be exalted over our fellows. Then that's not the way to do it. That's not the way that pleases the Father. We need to understand Jesus himself also was seeking greatness, but he was doing it in the way that pleased his Father, and that is by humbling himself to serve others. Everyone wants honor. We all want to be singled out. If we're believers, we especially want to be singled out by the Father. That's what James and John wanted, and Jesus did as well. But again, the way we must gain it is not in the way that they were seeking it. We must do it in the way that Jesus tells us we must, and that is by becoming servants to others. The lower you humble yourself to serve, the greater you will be in God's kingdom. If you want to be great, Jesus says, then you need to become the servant of all. So from this passage, I really want us to consider three things. And the first one may seem like it's not related, but it is. First of all, the choice that we make between living for ourselves or living for Christ reveals ultimately our final destination, heaven or hell. Second, if we choose to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to do it on his terms and not our own. We need to follow his example. And then thirdly, if we will take him on his terms and follow his example, not only does Jesus tell us that we will be with him in heaven, but he tells us that the Father will honor us, and that's what we're looking at, isn't it? The virtues that we should pursue in order to receive the blessing that the Lord has for us. So first of all, the choice be that we make between living for ourselves or living for Christ reveals our final destination. Jesus says in verse 25, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. I, I do want to point out that our Lord Jesus, in the verse just previous to this, in verse 24, basically is telling us that he's doing exactly the same thing. He is hating his life in this world in order to gain that which is real life. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He was talking about himself and how he was about to die in order that he might bring life to many. In other words, he was dying to himself in order that he might serve us, in order that we might have life. Well, we need to follow that same example. We need to die to ourselves as well in order that we may gain that, which is true life. Now, I've just reminded you that justification, which we usually use as a synonym for salvation, being declared righteous by God, is entirely by God's grace. It is received by faith. It is not the result of our works. And you also know, being Calvinist here, that the faith by which you receive the Lord Jesus Christ itself is a gift from God. It's a gift of His grace and mercy that He gives to whomever He wills. And that if you have received that grace of His faith and have trusted Jesus Christ, you will eventually arrive in heaven. That has to do with trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, we see in Scripture again and again, statements that seem to indicate that our destination is based upon choices we make on things that we do or don't do, almost as if it is really having to do with our works. And such is the text that is before us. Jesus says, if you love your life here, you will lose it. But if you hate your life here, you will gain eternal life. It almost sounds like that's something we have to do in order to be saved. So how do we reconcile those two things? 
Well, again, we simply need to remember where our choices actually come from. They come from our hearts. Our choices reveal what it is that we really want. And the only way we can then know our spiritual condition, whether we're saved or not saved, is by the things we choose to do or not to do. The things we choose to think, the things we choose to desire, the things we choose to say, and of course the things that we choose to do. Jesus is telling us here how we may know whether or not we have received his grace and are on our way to heaven. It has to do with whether or not we're choosing to live for ourselves or to live for him. This is the evidence of our spiritual condition. If you are living for yourself, Jesus says, if you love your life in this world, and by that he means if you are spending your time trying to embrace the world, trying to get what it is the world offers to you by way of fame and fortune and glory, if that's what you were choosing, your heart hasn't been changed. You're still a person of this world. You're still in your sins. And he says you will end up losing your life. What he means is losing your soul. But he says if you are living for him, if you hate this world, if you see that what it offers is really empty and have chosen to give up your life here in order to seek the things above, if that is your choice, then your heart really has been changed. Your sins are forgiven and you will live forever in heaven. Jesus said something very similar to this to his disciples on another occasion in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and forfeits his soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul see if you hang on to your life in this world if you embrace the world even if you gain the whole world what good is that going to be if you only get to hold on to it for a very short time and then you end up losing your soul and having to suffer for eternity what will a man give in exchange for his soul the uh, ransom for his soul is so costly that the only person who can pay it is the Lord Jesus Christ. But in order to receive it, we have to be willing to give up this world and embrace him and follow him. Now, if, if this is true, and of course we know it is, because our Lord Jesus Christ says it is, that what you choose reveals your spiritual condition and so your final destination, what do your choices reveal about you as far as what you're choosing? If they show that you really don't know him, then I pray that the Lord would show that to you. And again, I, I mean, I recognize that all of us, because we have the flesh still and we're struggling with sin, we'll still choose things that we know we shouldn't choose. But we also know that when we do that, we repent of it. We turn away from our sins and we renew our commitment to serve and follow the Lord. I'm talking about if your choices show that all you're seeking after is the world and you really don't want the things of heaven. May the Lord show you that that is the case and may he grant you grace and turn you to himself in order that you might live. Again, Jesus says in verse 25, he who loves his life loses it. You don't want to lose your life eternally. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. So your choice, your choices basically show your eternal destination. Now secondly, you need to understand this. If you choose to live for Jesus Christ, you do have to choose to do so on his terms. And so we need to understand what those terms are. Well, Jesus tells us in verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Now, have you chosen to live for Jesus? Do you believe that you are a believer? Then you must serve him. How are you to serve him? Well, not by, as it were, fits and spurts. 
but the same way that Jesus actually served his father. That's what he means when he says, he must follow me. You, he says, must follow him. So a question to ask yourself is this, what does your service actually look like? Well, many, of course, Christians today, and, and there are many who profess to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that they are serving Jesus on his terms, who serve him on Sundays, who come to the worship service, maybe once, maybe twice. Super Christians add a Wednesday evening to that, but they generally spend the rest of their time serving themselves doing what it is that they want to do rather than thinking about what is it that the Lord wants me to do and serving him now I think all of us fall into that kind of pattern but we need to understand Jesus is telling us this evening that that is not enough he says again in verse 26 if anyone serves me he must follow me and as we've already read in Matthew 16, verse 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. That's a word we don't like to hear. But it's something that Jesus calls us to do. We must deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow me. If you're going to serve the Lord, you must follow his example. Jesus does not call you to follow the example of others who profess to be Christians. He doesn't call you to follow the example of your Christian friends. He doesn't call you to follow the example of the youth group that you're involved in. He doesn't call you to follow the example of your Christian college classmates. Unless, of course, any of these happen to be following Jesus' example. You need to be following Jesus. Now, how much time did Jesus devote to serving his Father? All of his time. How much of his resources did he devote to his Father? He devoted all of them. How many of his talents did he employ in serving his Father? All of them. How much of his mind? How much of his heart? How much of his soul? How much of his strength? Jesus gave everything that he had to serve his father. Now again, this is the pattern. This is the example that Jesus has left for you and me to follow. This is the commandment that he gives to us. Really, it's the same thing that Paul meant when he wrote to the Romans in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul also wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. See, if you're going to choose somebody to imitate, it needs to be Jesus or somebody who happens to be following Jesus. It must not be anyone else. These are our Lord's terms. Now finally, if we've chosen then to live for Jesus Christ and we take him on his terms, if we follow his example and serve him in the way that he calls us to serve him, what does the Lord promise to do for us? What are the incentives that he holds out to us? Well, Jesus says that he will take us to be with him in heaven. And he says the Father will honor us. Jesus says in verse 26, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So first of all, if we serve him, Jesus says, we will be with him. Where I am, there my servant will be also. Now, of course, we know it is a great blessing to be in heaven and not to be in hell. And without going into the torments of hell, let's just think about the, pleasant, you know, the pleasures of heaven that are actually there. 
as Christians, those are the things that draw our hearts out. Well, first of all, we get to enjoy all the blessings of that world, which the Lord tells us is a world of perfect love and happiness, as well as avoiding that torment. That everyone who doesn't serve the Lord Jesus will have to endure in hell forever. So it is a world of perfect love. And we get to be swallowed up and immersed in it. <coughs> Secondly, in heaven, we will get to see the beatific vision. And this is something that is really hard to imagine. But we get to see God himself. Now, you know how pleasant it is to look at something that's beautiful. It, it gives you pleasure, right? But God is infinitely beautiful. So to look at him would be to see something that is so beautiful that we can't, can't even fathom, we can't even imagine how wonderful it will be just to look at him. Now, this, this is not, um, you know, not talking about being swallowed up in a world full of love and our hearts just bursting with love, but it's looking at something that is so glorious, so wonderful, and so infinitely beautiful that it just swallows up our imagination in wonder as we behold his glory. Well, that is what we get to see in heaven. Thirdly, we'll also get to see the glory that the Father has given to his Son, to the Savior whom we love, the glory that Jesus prayed that we might see in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 24. He prayed, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Now if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're certainly going to want to see his honor and the glory that the Father has bestowed upon him. You will be able to see that in heaven forever. Fourthly, you're also going to be able to see your fathers and your mothers, your brothers and your sisters, your children, your friends, who went to be, on, you know, to be with the Lord before you and those that are going to come after you. And you'll be able to love them and enjoy them forever. Do you love these people that I just talked about? If they have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you never truly lose them. But you get to spend eternity with them in this world of love, beholding the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son. Fifthly, you're also going to be able to see the rest of the saints those men and women that we admired in history, those people that we often hear about, read about, and you know, we're, we're just in awe of what the Lord did through them, we're going to be able to spend the rest of time with them as well and fellowship with them and worship with them forever. We're also going to be able to see the holy angels who watched over us and who protected us and brought us safely to heaven. We're going to get to fellowship with them and worship with them as well. Now, Jesus says that this is what he will give us if we will follow his example of service. He says in verse 26, Where I am, there my servant will be also. And that is what it is like where Jesus is. But secondly, I also mentioned the Father says, or well, actually Jesus tells us the Father will honor us. He says again in verse 26, If anyone serves me, the Father will honor honor him. Now this honor that is being referred to here begins in this life. The Lord is with those who will serve his son. The Lord will give those who serve his son what it is they ask for if they delight themselves in him and they are delighting in the son and they are following the son he will answer their prayers. He will give them what they want. He will bless them. He will prosper what they do. Now, in as far as it will help them to live for his glory, we realize there are sometimes the Lord doesn't answer certain prayers because the things we're asking for are things he doesn't want us to have because it's better that we don't have them than when we do have them. But he will give us everything that we need and he will give us all that we ask for if it will be for our good. And that is one of the main reasons, as I've said before, why there are some the Lord is more willing to listen to than to others. James writes in James 5, verses 16 through 18, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And then he uses an historic example to show us that this is in fact true. 
which means it's not just the person who is in Christ because then he could use anybody as an example. But he does pick out a one a person who was marked for his righteousness and whom the Lord wonderfully answered his prayers, Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Makes me wonder if there isn't an Elijah around who has been praying lately for several years of drought and then prayed again and now the, you know, the sky is giving its rain. God hears the prayers of those who take him seriously. But we need to understand there is also that honor that the Father will give in heaven to those who will serve him. The more you serve him here, the greater that honor will be. There are degrees of reward in heaven which the Lord will give on that day. Honor that we will get to keep forever. Paul tells us in Romans 2, verses 6 through 11, that God will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Now Paul does remind us the same things we just saw. If we're living a worldly life and we're seeking worldly things, we're just storing up for ourselves wrath and indignation on the day of God's judgment. But if we are pursuing, doing good, seeking God's glory, seeking honor, seeking immortality, those are the people who receive eternal life. But he also says in here that we will be re rewarded according to what we do on that day of judgment. Glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good. And so again, our choices show what our eternal destination is. If we have chosen to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we must follow him on his terms, and his terms are that we serve him with all that is within us. And if we are willing to do that, the Lord says he will, we will be with him in heaven. That will be our destination. But the Father will also honor us. And to the degree that we honor him in this world, in our service of him, to that degree, he will honor us. And so as Joshua said to God's people so many years ago in Joshua 24, 14 through 15, I believe the Lord says to us this evening, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You realize that this is just as applicable today as it was then. If you serve the idols of this world, fame, fortune, and glory, which the vast majority of mankind serve. Some of them actually get it. But what do they get in the end when they die? Well, if you seek after these things and you serve these things your entire life, you will lose your life, Jesus says, and sink down into hell. But if you serve the Lord on his terms at all times, with all you have, in everything you do, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, he says he will not only give to you eternal life, he will not only bring you to heaven, where you'll get to see all those beautiful sights we talked about earlier and enjoy such wonderful company. But he will richly honor you here. He will hear your prayers and he will bless you. And he will give you honor and glory there in heaven. 
Again, the Lord says to you what he says through Moses so many years ago in Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 through 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him for this is your life and the length of your days you know the difference between the old covenant from which I've just read and the new covenant is not that God wanted them to obey in the old covenant but you don't have to obey in the new covenant the difference is that God gives you the ability to obey him in the new covenant through his Holy Spirit who takes his law writes it on your minds and on the tablets of your heart so that this is what he, you know, that you want to do now. If you have received that grace, this is what your heart is telling you. Yes, I hear this. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to seek to do. If you do this again, the Lord will bless you in these ways. But again, I would remind you, take a good look at your life and look at your choices and see what's really going on. Do you love Him? Are you really seeking to serve Him? Have you chosen life? Or are you still choosing death? If you are choosing death, then I would again exhort and encourage you this evening to choose life that you may live by loving the Lord, by obeying His voice, by holding fast to Him, by coming to Jesus Christ, turning from your sins, trusting Him, and following Him. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. and let's, let's ask the Lord to show us where we're at, particularly as we prepare to come to the table this evening.